Nothing connects us physically faster to people and places than airplanes. The first version of a viable plane was invented more than 100 years ago. And ever since, we've been always in need for speed. If you look at the history of uh, uh, airplanes and the progress there, in 1935, to fly from Brisbane to London, it took 12 days. The longer than 12,000 miles trip was divided into more than 20 stops. The plane had only 10 passengers on board. Fast forward 2018, the Boeing Dreamliner uh, flies direct flight, offers 236 seats, and in only 17 hours, speed indeed. The airplanes today are commercial jets that are offered for continental and intercontinental flights. Over time, we built airports near large cities and then smaller cities, and we built hubs and connections. It is estimated that by 2040, 20 billion passengers will travel by air, which is astounding considering that the population of uh, the planet was at the end of last year, 7.7 .7 billion people. We were looking for traveling faster and faster, longer distances, but there's an emerging market and there's an emerging sector in the local regions where basically there's a need to move people and goods without the use of a runway and probably between two smaller cities that don't not necessarily have uh, airports. This is a perfect example, for instance, for the new approach to travel, where basically you fly between two different points without uh, using a hub. Uh, but it's also very important for emergencies, global emergencies. In an emergency, time is a factor that can be saving lives. And if you had the airplane that is easy to handle, easy to offer, is runway independent, then you can make a difference. The difference is between saving and losing lives. We have radically shrunk the time travel by airplane between far-flung airports, and now we want to shrink the time to reach remote and virtually unreachable uh, areas. If the first response team, in a case of a natural disaster, can get in the first 48 hours in an area affected and offer help, medical evacuation, treat the wounded, and so on, we would make a huge difference. In 2015, we had the Kathmandu earthquake. And I'm sure many of you were watching the news, just like I did, in frustration. For weeks at the time, we were watching how these village, villages were decimated in the mountains, and there was no help coming because there was no means to deliver help to these people. There were trucks at the bottom of the mountains full of supplies that would not be able to climb the roads because the roads were no more longer secure or not even existing. This event was one of the things that influenced me to start Jetoptera. What you see there in the circle is a basically just a 50-mile radius from Kathmandu, probably the only airport remaining in the area that uh, was not affected. But this is just an example. We had also the Fukushima disaster and also the Hurricane Katrina in uh, the United States. The Haiti uh, earthquake. In all these cases, the infrastructure was wiped out. There was no way to deliver the supplies to people in need. Accustomed to the speeds of, at which we cross the globe, people no longer see waiting as an uh, acceptable option before the infrastructure is being fixed. And now they look at the skies for help. This is one aspect of the uh, problem we have at hand. 
The other one is what we call paleo future. This is a shorthand term coined to mean past forecasts of the future that never happened. Think of the Jetsons. Mr. Lees was promised in the 50s that within 10 years he will be able to take off vertically, fly for 75 miles every day to work while carpooling with his neighbor. It never happened. Of course, investment has a lot of influence on this. In the past five years, venture capital investment has been 50% in software, about 25% in um, biotech. And aviation would fall under industrial, but half of that is clean tech. There's nothing wrong with it, but batteries today cannot support aviation in terms of propulsion. Traditional fuels are in fact two orders of magnitude, uh, better in energy uh, content. So what we call energy density. So wouldn't it be great though to have an airplane and a propulsion system that is actually energy agnostic, something that could use the traditional fuels today, be able to do the job of emergency services or help Mr. Lees get to work. And then in a couple of decades, when the battery is ready, make the shift to that energy source. That's one of the challenges. The other challenge is that the vertical takeoff propulsion is kind of a strange animal. It has to behave in a different manner at cruise conditions where you only have to defeat the drag force. So it's just a fraction of the aircraft weight. But when you take off vertically and you have to hover, you have to produce more thrust than the weight of the aircraft. Uh, alone. So that's at least four times more than uh, uh, propulsion that is needed for cruise conditions. In effect, this propulsion system has to behave a little bit like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Hyde, of course, at takeoff. We asked ourselves, how could we make an improvement and create drones that are powerful enough to help people and then scalable all the way to a flying car? The answer was the propulsion system. In fact, if you look at the history of aviation, always when you have a big change, it starts with the propulsion system. That's really what enables everything. So we started Jetoptera with the thought that we will be developing a new propulsion system that will enable what we call a fast VTOL, something that can take off vertically, but fly much faster than a helicopter and be able to sneak in places where helicopters cannot access. Something that could be used, for instance, in instances like Kathmandu earthquake to help save lives. So we invented what is called the fluidic propulsion system, which combined with a novel airframe, we think is going to revolutionize both regional commute as well as um, emergency services. So what is the fluidic propulsive system. Well, it's a system that is depending right now on gas turbines and traditional fuels, but it can switch to batteries with an electric driven compressor. The few things about the propulsion system is that it contains no moving parts. So you can have the compressor on the inside of the aircraft supplying with the high pressure fluid, this devices we call thrusters. And one of the neat things about it is that we can give these thrusters non-round shapes. All legacy systems spin like a propeller and are round in aviation. Well, we're not. And the beauty of it is that now you can make it conforming with the wing and you can have the wing and the propulsion system work together to get you something better than separate. The other thing about the thrusters is that you can 3D print them. You can make them out of plastic. The beauty of it is that you can swivel them. And now you have the basis of a vertical takeoff and landing propulsion system that can propel this aircraft at 200 miles per hour. And you can scale it up from 100 pounds uh, aircraft to all the way 4,000 pounds. Another aspect of it is that the noise. Rotary aircraft is notorious for making a lot of noise. 
And it's not only the sound pressure, but it's also the repetitive, the percussion nature of the rotary aircraft. In this case, we have a streamlined flow that is not going to produce that kind of repetitive um, noise. We think uh, our edges in the propulsion system, especially since it gives us a unique ability to do fast veto. But we also invented a better integrated airframe that has a box wing and canard wings in front of the aircraft. And that allows for a better integrated and better efficiency aircraft that flies much faster than a helicopter. We think that, and we want ultimately to build a flying car, but we also think that drones helping people, um, it's a great start. Ultimately, our end goal is to be the propulsion platform for the next generation of mobility. So in effect, the FPS, eliminates the need for rotors, allows the aircraft to go faster after the vertical takeoff. And maybe the most important part is that it's energy agnostic. When the battery that is light and safe to be used for aviation will be invented, we will be ready to switch to that kind of uh, energy. Before that, we can use traditional fuels to help people in need and to revolutionize the uh, regional commute. So how do you go about designing something new in the world of propulsion? First of all, five years ago, I was working for a large company. And in fact, I was working on the largest turbofan ever produced. Three and a half, almost three and a half meters in diameter that had 16 blades the size of a purse. And I switched from that, I started Jetoptera to something that is bladeless, a fluidic uh, propulsion system that is a bladeless fan on steroids, but it has no moving parts. I started in my driveway and in my garage by renting a tow behind air compressor, which is commonly used in agriculture. And sometimes, no joke, the smell will tell you that it's been used before in agriculture. I uh, 3D printed about 200 concepts. And I built up a setup to estimate the input and the output from the system. In other words, I was measuring how much air I was sending to these thrusters and how much thrust they were producing. We down selected from this about five concepts and then we moved on to the turbine that would power these thrusters. Tests were conducted in uh, my uh, driveway when I was living in Ohio, and I was very lucky that the neighbors were actually ex-turbine guys, and they were very intrigued by the whole thing. These were all static tests in my driveway back in 2016. But then again, you have to test the turbine also on the move. So in order to do that, what I did, I attached some of these turbines to my bike and took a couple of rides through the neighborhood. I did not take off. <laughs> Having decided what are the best concepts, we scaled them up and we went to the University of Washington that has an outstanding wind tunnel and an outstanding team. These are all students that helped us uh, collect very important data. And this is when we had the aha moment where we realized the potential of the FPS to propel an aircraft forward in winds of 150 miles per hour. This is even better than a helicopter today, a small helicopter. So we moved on with the next step, which was taking exactly these thrusters that were, I want you to watch in this video, the safe tape on the back and the metal glowing. That's the sign that we connected the gas turbine with the hot gases coming out of it to the thrusters. And for the first time, in the world, this FPS was fired once again in my driveway, once again supported by my neighbors. We produced about 45 pound force with this one. The next step was to take the system and actually put it on a glider. And we actually took off with it on 4th of July of 2018. We um, took off with this airplane 
propelled solely by our, by our uh, propulsion system. You can see the clean geometry of the system and the fact that it's see-through. Once we were done with this test, and remember, this is the Dr. Jekyll mode of flying. We had to also demonstrate the Mr. Hyde. In order to do that, we placed these thrusters, the very same ones, but this time they were swiveling, and we were able to show that we can lift up 100 pounds of uh, platform shown here. We had to use a tether in this case because of the regulations and safety. So now we demonstrated both Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde modes. We felt that we we're pretty confident about the way we developed the propulsion system. It was time to focus our attention on the airframe. Remember, it, you have to have both of them to integrate them and to get that benefit. We built a 25% scale of the flying car. And we were able to demonstrate with electric ducted fans because we did not want to risk the FPS, but we demonstrated the control of the aircraft. The fact that it can take off vertically, it can hover, it can translate into forward flight and fly at over 100 miles per hour. This came as a result of rather painful development. We had several crashes, of course, and several successes. So we learned from both and we collected quite a bit of data learning how to fly the airplane. The airplane can stop in midair and snoop around like you see in this footage, looking probably for survivors or to pick up something or to look for a landing spot for uh, Mr. Lee's. <laughs> And then you can accelerate back to forward uh, speeds. Remember, no rotors means that we can access places that rotor aircraft cannot, between trees, power lines, and so on. The next step is the big thing. The dream of the flying car that has been there for decades. We feel that with the fluidic propulsive system, we can make a difference so we can actually deliver we're closer to connecting people fast and we are runway independent. So we will revolutionize the regional commute as well as the emergency services. We dream of the world where area mobility is a common place. So keep an eye on the changing skies because chances are one day a VTOL aircraft will come pick you up and take you to London. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention and thank you for the invitation.